Good evening, everybody. Welcome to TSM's devotional as usual, and uh, welcome to those who are watching us online. We are delighted to have you tonight. So this is our devotional number 11 this evening already, actually. And as you know already, we carry on in uh, the doctrine of bibliology. I said that and I repeat once again that this will take a few, a few weeks to do, uh, close to 30-some, maybe a year in bibliology, because there is, it is so dense and we have so much material to cover. But I rely on you to follow up. The midday uh, videos will stay posted for a while, so you are basically capable of catching up. As we uh, do usually, let's take a short silent time online together, uh, do a short word of prayer, and then carry on with our exposition. Tonight, I'm going to be speaking, as you see behind me on the board, on the doctrine within Bibli Bibliology of Illumination. So the night will prove to, prove to be packed, so I rely on you, and the Spirit of God within us to do a good exposition. Let's take our silent time and we go for it. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence, although we are always in your presence, but I mean by this, with this style of worship for the, nice, for the next 35 minutes or so. We give you thanks for the privilege to do it, those in person, in classroom, physically present, and those also who will be watching online. We thank you for this in advance. May they be touched and uh, deepening their roots in the knowledge of their Savior, and being well grounded in the scriptures, that's the very purpose, actually, of this um, exposition on bibliology. We give you thanks in advance, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Once again, division, uh, not division, but devotional 11. So what we have done so far, beloved, we have uh, worked on the work of introductory material in the first few uh, seminars, our devotional sessions, and so on. Then we extensively deal with uh, Roman numeral 2, Revelation, the doctrine of Revelation, always within Bibliology. Then we went into Inspiration, which was the third segment out of actually uh, 12 segments. And the last few weeks, two or three last sessions on it, it was extensive. We dealt with canonicity and authority. And now tonight, we come on uh, Roman numeral 5, Illumination. And again, it is in the realm of Bibliology. And Illumination will be divided in four or three major categories. Definition, capital B, the unsaved, always in relationship to Illumination. And C, the saved, and then a short word of conclusion at the end. So if you are ready with me, make your notes and turn in your Bible. If you are ready, if you have your Bible with you, with you in 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 to chapter 3, verse 2, which we'll basically look into it in a moment. Let's define it within the three or four major categories that are behind me. Definition, it's a clarification, if you wish, clarification on distinctiveness. We looked at Revelation, number one, what, Revelation deals with what is communicated. Revelation deals with what is communicated, and it has to do with the receiving of the truth. So Revelation deals with what is communicated. communicated. We have seen that already. It has to do with the receiving of the truth, and it deals with the content of the truth or the material of the truth. Secondly, before we define illumination together, we dealt with inspiration, which was the third segment, Roman numeral three. Inspiration has to do with the recording, the communication, infallibly and without error. Inspiration is concerned with the method of the recording of the truth, the recording of the revelation, any kind of recording of the truth. That's the issue of inspiration. Now we come to illumination. Illumination. Let's slow down the pace. Let's define it. Illumination has to do with the understanding. Illumination has to do with the understanding of the revelation and the inspire, inspiration of it also. Illumita illumination has to do with the understanding of revelation, which was recorded in written form. Are you with me? Illumination has to do with the understanding of revelation which was recorded in written form. 
meaning the records of it, that's the doctrine of illumination. Let's define it in a deeper way. Illumination, beloved, is the influence or the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which enables all who are in the right relationship with God to understand the scriptures. It's crucial. I'll repeat that for your benefit right now. How do we define illumination? Illumination is the influence, or if you prefer, ministry, of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God, which enables all people who are in the right relationship with God to understand the scriptures. It is to understand the divine unfolding of the scriptures which has already been given. Are you with me? One more time. Illumination is the influence of the Holy Spirit, which enables all who are in the right relationship. What do you mean by that, Francois? All who sustain a relationship with God through Christ enables all who are in the right relationship with God to understand the Scriptures. It is to understand the divine unfolding of the Scripture, of the Scriptures which is already given. Now I ask you to, to turn into 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. This is the main passage on the doctrine of illumination. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Tonight we'll read a little bit more scriptures, straight down to chapter 3, verse 2. We'll take it verse by verse. Come. But just as it is written, things which the eye, things which eye has not seen, and here has not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared, prepared for those who love him. The verse 9 emphasizes the need for revelation. Jot down in your notes that there are things that we would never know unless God would reveal it to us. Okay? It's impossible to know God basically without having God revealing these things to us. So the emphasis of verse 9 is the need for revelation, okay? Because there are things we would never know unless God would choose to reveal it. Reread your verse 9 by your own. Verse 10, come. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. God has done the work of revelation. That's what it does emphasize here. And God has chosen to reveal. So thanks be to Him, because if we know something about God, once again, it's because the work of illumination, He has chosen to reveal. Verse 11. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. That was verse 11. It deals here with the need for illumination. We, as natural people, cannot understand the things of God. So when we are natural people, meaning unregenerated people, we cannot understand the things of God. So verse 11 basically deals with the need for illumination. Let's take the verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit, capital S, who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, in verse 12. So we have received the Spirit of God, and we can indeed understand the things of the Scriptures. So for those who are in the right relationship with God, we have received the Spirit of God, so therefore, we are enabled to understand the things of the Scriptures, thing, things that are recorded for us from the Bible. So there is no such a thing. We cannot say that this is too difficult to understand because it's the work of the Holy Spirit to make us understand the deep things of God. Are you still with me? Yeah. So like I said, illumination, beloved, will prove to be a very, very important segment of our studies right now. Verse 13 same passage, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. 
Here, it deals with the inspiration of the text. To understand, if we, uh, to understand it, we need illumination. So to understand what the Bible is saying, basically we need to come as a child dependent on the Holy Spirit, depending on the Holy Spirit, to teach us what we need to understand. Now, verses, chapter 2, verses 14 to, three, to, to, to chapter 3, verse 2, deals with the ministry of illumination with humanity. And again, I covet all your energy for concentration right here. In chapter 2, verses 14, straight down to chapter 3, verse 2, it deals with the ministry of illumination with the humanity here. Okay, let's start with number one, illumination with the unbelievers in 14. Come with me. But the natural man, circle natural man, does not accept the things of the Spirit or of God, because they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand, circle cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. Simply put on your notes, the work of illumination is not given to the unbeliever. It is impossible for the unbeliever to understand the deep things of God. This is not a ministry given to the unbelievers. Illumination and now the spiritual believer, verses 15 and 16. But he who is spiritual, circle that sentence, appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So the true believer received the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The true believer receives the ministry of the Holy Spirit and he has the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is the source of understanding the word of God. The mind of Christ is the source of understanding the mind of God. So where do you go, Francois? The unsaved that we will see in a moment, more in a deeper way, they don't have the work of illumination. The work of illumination is a specific work of the Holy Spirit which enables the mind of the believer to understand the deep things of God. We cannot comprehend these things by ourselves, beloved. So now the calculation and the equation can be made. Therefore, the glory goes to Him. If we know one thing about God, beloved, it's not because we have discovered it. It is because it's been revealed to us, believers, and so on. In chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, let's read them. It talks about the carnal believer. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as, sp as spiritual men, as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. Circle that. I give you milk. To drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it, the solid food. Indeed, even now, you are not able. Verses 1 and 2 talks about the carnal believer. That person lacks maturity. And the example here is that, is that they can only understand the milk of the Word of God, not the meat of the Word of God. And I want to be very kind with you right now, those in class and those online as well, that there is a lot of believers that have stain in a state of a spiritual immaturity. Okay? Church leaders should be more conscientious of feeding the flock with the meat. We cannot wait 10 years before, before embarking into the meat of the Word of God. As soon as you've been a believer for a year or two, you are ready, beloved, to get into the meaty doctrines of the Word. Okay? Let's carry on here with capital B, the unsaved. The unsaved always in relationship to the work of illumination. Okay, we have defined it right now. We read the main passage on the issue. Are you okay? We read the main passage on the issue here. This is the first Corinthians chapter 2 verses 9 to chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. This is the primary passage on that. And then now we move to the unsaved. Are you ready with me? We have five things to look at concerning the unsaved and blindness. And on this again, I covet your attention. Because you might very well hear things here that you might uh, not have heard before. The unsaved blindness, five things. Number one, 
They are in blindness, the unsafe, and dwelling in darkness. This is what we call general blindness or darkness. Write that down on your notes. A general blindness or a general darkness. It's true of all men since the fall. This is true of all people on this planet since the fall. That's what we call general darkness or general blindness. John chapter 1 verse 5. The book of John chapter 1 verse 5 reads like this. The light shines in darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is one passage concerning general darkness. The book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8. The book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So that's another uh, scripture showing, uh, showing that one time in darkness we were before all of us get him saved. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. So this is the first thing that I wanted to explain concerning the general blindness or general darkness. This is true of all believers starting at the fall. Secondly, second thing about the uh, unsaved and the blindness, it's the specific Gentile blindness or Gentile darkness. Gentile. Same word, blindness or Gentile darkness as well will do the work. They are viewed as being in darkness. The Gentiles are viewed as being in darkness. According to Acts chapter 26, verses 17 and 18. Acts chapter 26, verses 17 and 18. But I would like to read for you the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 21. You still with me? Chapter 1, verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him, capital H, as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now I'm talking about the Gentile, Gentile blindness, or Gentile darkness. That was my point number two. In a more complicated way, we have also Israel blindness. Israel blindness. On this one, allow me to spend a little bit more time. Israel blindness or Israel darkness. A blindness has befallen on Israel. A blindness has befallen on Israel. It is specific to this nation. And it was prophesied this way by the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, which I will read for you. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Where are you? In Israel, blindness. So a type of blindness has befallen on the nation as a whole, except, of course, for the remnant. It was prophesied by the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, 9 and 10. It goes like this. He said, go, tell these people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but don't understand. Render the hearts of this people, the Jewish people, insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and return and be healed. It was prophesied by Isaiah. Another reference in Isaiah, chapter 29, verses 10 and 11. Chapter 29, verses 10 and 11, concerning Israel's blindness. It was prophesied by Isaiah. And then it came into fulfillment in Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, verses 13 to 15. Matthew chapter 13, 
verses 13 to 15. This is very much, I need to pause, beloved, for a moment, even for those in class right now. This is very new for the people. Not all the people need, uh, uh, hear about these things nowadays. So we need to understand that the nation as a whole here suffers a specific blindness. And we're talking about the work of illumination. So I will elaborate a little bit more. It was prophesied by Isaiah. And then the fulfillment of these prophecies came in the time of the Messiah. Now I have sent you in Matthew chapter 13, verses 13 to 15. Therefore I speak to them in parables. That's the word of the, the, word of the Messiah. Because while seeing, they don't see. And while hearing, they don't hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, you see, which says you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, which their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their, heart, uh, with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return and I would heal them. That's the Jewish blindness. Okay? Other scriptures on that without reading them right now. Mark chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Luke chapter 8, verses 9 to 10. John chapter 12, verses 36 to 40. Acts chapter 28, verses 25 to 27. Now I elaborate on it. Elaboration on Israel's blindness to make it more understandable. Let me say four things. Israel's blindness was caused by a, re a rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus. That's what we call the unforgivable sin. So Israel's blindness was caused by the rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus. Make a note of this sentence. Israel was not blinded in order for them to reject. But because Israel did reject, they became blinded. Israel was not blinded in order to reject. Rather, but because Israel did reject, they were blinded to the truth. You find that truth in the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. And the result of that blindness, beloved, which is even more dramatic, it's based on Romans chapter 11. Would you come to Romans chapter 11? Romans chapter 11, verses 13 to 24. I'm just going to read a few things here. But the result of it was that the natural branches, the Jews, were cut off of the olive tree, which is the place of blessing. I repeat this. The natural branches, which are the Jews, the natural branches in Romans chapter 11, were cut off of the olive tree, which belonged to Israel, because the olive tree is the place of blessing. And of course, these things are not true of the believing remnant, because there is always a believing remnant within the nation. R Romans chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. Listen closely. I say then, God has not rejected as his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. That's Paul speaking. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to Elijah or to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice, and so on. So that's the Israeli blindness. Other scriptures on that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 16. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Let me say one more thing about the Israeli blindness here. It's not permanent. It's only temporary until the, full, the fullness of the Gentile be come in. It's not, it's not permanent. 
it's only temporary until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Scriptures on it, Romans chapter 11, 25 to 27. Romans chapter 11, I'm right there, 25 to 27, so I will read it for you. For I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. That's exactly what we're talking about. Until the fullness of the Gentile has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the Deliverer will come from, from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away, when I will take away their sins and so on. So simply put again in your notes that this is not permanent. It's only temporary until the last Gentiles will come to faith in the church age. Then the, the uh, blindness, the Israeli blindness will be taken away. This will... Uh, cover more if uh, when we read eschatology towards the end of the program years down the road when i will be teaching the book of revelation and so on we will cover more, more way more than what we are covering right now point number four are you still with me yeah okay point number four satanic blindness i need to say four things about satanic blindness based upon second corinthians second corinthians chapter four verses three and four 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Let me say four things about that passage, very briefly. The unbelieving world is blinded to the gospel. The unbelieving world is blinded to the gospel. This blindness, secondly, is a veil upon them. That's, uh, that's what the passage says. This blindness is a veil upon them. And they suffer an incapacity to respond to the gospel. They are not capable of responding to the gospel because the blindness is imposed by Satan. Number one, the unbelieving world is blinded to the gospel. The, blind, the, uh, the blindness is a veil upon them. Number three, there is an incapacity to respond to the gospel. And number four, it's imposed by Satan. Okay, based upon Ephesians chapter six verse twelve, the believers wrestle. The believers wrestle in a world system that is blinded by Satan. When you read Ephesians chapter six verse 12, 12, we as believers wrestle in a world system that is blinded by Satan. That was the thing number four concerning satanic blindness and so on. Thing number four, basically concerning the unsaved, suffering blindness and so on. Number five, illumination in the unsaved. Illumination in the unsaved. The purpose of it, illumination here with the unsaved, is only to understand the gospel. It's going to work with them, illumination, only to understand the gospel. Okay, Whether they come to faith or not, Unbelief, illumination and the unsaved will only render them capable to understand the gospel. Would you come with me in John 16? John chapter 16, the gospel of John chapter 16. You still with me? Let's carry on for another 10 minutes here. The gospel of John chapter 16 verses 7 to 11. We'll read that in a moment. How do we define conviction? How do we define conviction? Conviction is the acknowledgement that something is true. Conviction is the acknowledgement when we acknowledge that something is true. That's conviction. Come with me in John chapter 16, verses 7 to 11. But I tell you the truth. 
It is to your advantage that I go away, because if I do not go away, the Helper will, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin. Circle carefully the word sin. Circle righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world, Satan, has been judged. So they do understand the gospel. To come back a few minutes here, they do understand the gospel whether or not they have Christ. So that's the only part that will work, that will make the work of illumination work on a non-believer. So the Holy Spirit will open their mind to understand the gospel, whether they make a choice for Christ on that day or not. That's the sustaining issue with illumination in the unsaved. When it says in the passage here, conviction of sin, the specific sin talked about here is the sin of unbelief. Rejection, failure to believe on Christ. That's the specific sin here. Concerning righteousness, that's the righteousness of Christ, proven by the ascension. When he ascended to, to God the Father, he could not have been there if he would have been sinful. So that's conviction of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. People understand that when they are endowed with the illumination factor on the unsaved. And convicting conviction of judgment. This is the final judgment of the great white throne judgment. If Satan has already been judged, how much more will his follower be judged as well? So that's the three things concerning the work of conviction. And I say that again to you. The work of illumination will be done on the unsaved only to help them to understand the gospel, whether they make a commitment to Christ or not. I know it's complicated, but we're laying down the foundation. And beloved, once again, it is imperative to understand within the work of evangelism that we do in our churches today. People don't have a tick mark in the back. We don't know who will be saved, so you just go for it. You share the gospel. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of the people so the people may come to saving faith. And then illumination will work on them as a babe in Christ. They will learn things and so on. They will grow in the faith in the same way that we do. But this is, these things are difficult to understand for now. That's why on YouTube or online you can pause these things and go back. And they are not always easy to teach as well. So we have time, another seven minutes, to take the work on the saved. To take the work on the saved people. The two types. Please go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Go back there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14, again, chapter 2, verse 14, up to chapter 3, verse 2. We talked about this passage already, but now I just want to examine the passage with different lens to understand different things. Let's start with the unsaved. This is the unsaved in verse 14 who has no ability to understand. But the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness to him, and so on. Simply put on your notes, the unsaved has no ability. He is the natural man. Now we come to the spiritual man. But he who is spiritual appraises of all things. We read that here. That's the, the believer. You have two types of believers in this passage. Okay? You have the spiritual man. We, we dismiss the unbeliever already. But now we're talking about verse 15, the spiritual man, he who is spiritual, that's the believer. So that person has the supernatural ability or capacity to understand, given by the work of illumination. And then you have the carnal believer in the same passage here, in, verse, in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I give you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able. So that's the carnal believer. Okay? The carnal believer is still laboring under a carnal blindness. That's the one that failed to mature. 
He is called a believer in the passage here. Okay? He is also called a babe in Christ. There is nothing sinful by being a babe in Christ. All of us start as babies in the Messiah. We cannot embark into the deep things of God on the first day of salvation. Like I repeat, there is no such a thing as being sinful as being babe, but we need to move on, beloved. And that's exactly why we do these classes. That person, the carnal believer, is truly regenerated, but he has failed to mature in the Lord. He is stuck onto the milk of the word, is not able to receive the meat of the word. The book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 11 to 14, makes the same point. So the one receives the illumination, here the spiritual man has the full-fledged, if I can express myself this way, of illumination of the spirit. The other, in a more limited way if you want to, because of carnality. This is a very serious issue. I will basically stop soon, but here there is an invitation with these videos and class being done here, an invitation to grow in maturity. Are you with me? This is very, very dear on the soul and on the heart and the purpose of the sword ministries to get into discipleship and to grow together in maturity. A person cannot stay for 10 years, dear beloved, fed with the milk or the crumbs of the Word of God. So we'll stop here for tonight. We'll keep it a shorter session tonight. Next week I will come to you. I will finish illumination here and we will get also into a small portion uh, Roman numeral 6, the doctrine of animation always within bibliology. So we have defined it. I'm not ready to close it right now officially because we're not done. It's a lot of material conveyed upon you. So I just want to take my time and uh, next uh, week we'll deal with capital C, illumination with the saved here. And then it's going to take just a few minutes of the session next week to finish it properly. So we thank you again uh, in advance at TSM for following me up so faithfully with these uh, devotionals and so on. You know what to do if you are prompt to uh, bless the ministry, visit the website. You have the button to donate and so on through PayPal, PayPal and so forth. So let's take a time of silent time and prayer and then we'll see each other again next week. Father, we thank you for the time that we make to dig into the scriptures and we confess that it's not always easy. The meat is the meat and we need to chew and we need to have practice in order to get into it. I personally thank you for the privilege to be able to do so. I'm asking you to bless the people physically in front of me and also to bless who will commit to listen to these things online. And we ask these things, Father, in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. We bid you shalom. Thank you. See you next week.